to another episode of Wild and Precious Conversations. I'm Wendy. This week again, it's going to be a about 20 minute riff on the theme of the week, which was benevolence. Exactly plan it this way. A couple things are going on. First, I'm really, really working on a conversation that I'm pretty sure is going to be dropping next Thursday morning. Um, and until then, I've been really contemplating where I'm going with the podcast, uh, where I'm going with this project, and a lot of other things as well. And seemed to make sense to do another short sort of oral essay this week. I wonder I mean honestly this morning I have an image of Ukrainian grandmas on my mind as I write this as I say this what would a benevolent world actually look like? It's been on my mind all week. Um, usually by the end of the weekend, I've really solidified what that week has meant to me. And so Monday morning, I wake up and I sort of write what I consider to be a gift of a Monday morning newsletter for myself and the lovely subscribers um, to sort of start our weeks off in a contemplative and loving and sort of, yeah, that sort of space. This week has been interesting, let's say. When my, one of my progeny came downstairs for dinner and let me know that 38 minutes ago basically, or something like that, you know, Russia had invaded the Ukraine. I, I don't know. It set me off again thinking, what would a benevolent world look like? And it had been sort of simmering in my own tiny world as well. I think what I came to, at least for my own world, is that a benevolent world would be moving a lot more slowly. It seems as though it's the actions and thoughts that happen in the moment really quickly without thought that really sort of push forward a world that's less benevolent. I have a tiny story. Yesterday, I did a simple, seemingly benevolent thing for one of my progeny. And I made them a smoothie. And no, no one was hurt. But in counseling later that day, this smoothie making became the event that helped me unravel what keeps me from benevolence in my own life. So I'm going to try to try to unravel that here. That thing is safety. I'm going to try to explain this because I think I'm not alone. I made a smoothie filled with lots of really healthy stuff. Also delicious. <laughs> Just sweet enough. They drank most of it, but not all of it. And so what I ended up doing was even bringing that tiny amount with us in the car so that they could have one more chance as I implored them to finish the whole thing. <laughs> they very politely said no thank you to their credit and stayed relatively calm while I was, I, I think that the voice I have right now perfectly ex sort of mimics what my voice was that morning. Come on, just one more sip. What? By the time I got back home, I was aware enough to realize that something was going on, I actually forced myself to measure it out and show myself clearly <laughs> what was going on. The, the amount of smoothie that had been left was negligible. If I were really worried about malnutrition, I don't think that that was a problem. So what was this angst all about, really? 
obviously not nutrition. The feeling in my body when the smoothie was refused, or again, this tiny amount of smoothie was refused, was one of foreboding and dread. I'm really not proud of admitting this. In fact, I hesitated, hesitated as I was like, come on, just say it out loud. But it's true. (laughs) As I drove home from counseling and ran a couple errands on my way home, I was unpacking more what I think was going on. And I think it is this universal feeling that comes up for all of us, but all of us in a slightly different way. Robert Sapolsky, the Stanford, I believe he's a biologist. Almost sure of that. He's written a book called Behave. And he has several lovely videos out there talking about his work. And, and in one of them, he uh, explains that the love hormone, oxytocin, amplifies feelings of love for people who are in our in-group. But it also amplifies feelings of not love or more exclusion for people who are outside our in-group. That sets up something kind of interesting, I think. Think about it. We all need to create a sense of, I'll call it Eden, a sense of safety, a perimeter around ourselves within which we're at ease. I don't really like noticing that I do this, but I think it's key. I think it's really the key to why benevolence is so hard sometimes, even with people we adore. My castle walls are built around an idea that our family, in our family, we are healthy. Yikes. As you may be aware, There have been marauding vandals and thieves and whatnot banging on my castle walls for the past couple years, past few years. (laughs) My castle is also built around an idea that we're immune to violence. Violence happens out there to other people. I'm still not really ready to talk about this super publicly, but... It's important for this essay to mention that extreme violence at the hands of the system did happen to our family about a year ago. As I say this, my hands are shaking and my heart is racing. The system metaphorically took a battle ram and knocked out one of the metaphorical walls in my metaphorical castle. Metaphorically, but also in a, well, in a realer way. Realer way. My family, my Eden, became fragile. And so I can very much understand not being benevolent. It's literally why I'm in counseling. (laughs) Back to the smoothie, because the smoothie drinking episode, deconstructed in counseling, began to help me unpack all of this. As I drove home from counseling, a police car passed me. And as it did so, I literally sat up straighter, tensing up, because they are that symbol of the system who introduced violence into our family. I found my body aware. And then a thought, actually quite humorous. First, the thought, I am not making this up. I thought to myself, if we're all quiet, no one gets hurt. (laughs) And then, less humorous, a flashback to a scene that had come up in counseling, a scene of early kind of violence in my life at gymnastics. I would have been around 11 years old. 
And at least once we had to sit cross-legged along a wall perfectly still for two hours. And then there's another tiny scene. I had just finished bars and was moving to floor, which was a brand new spring floor. And back in those days, very few gyms had those Olympic quality spring floors. My hand was bleeding as it would uh, from the bars they would rip. Um, so I showed my coach out of fear of getting blood on his floor. Instead, though, he took my he hand, considered it a moment of weakness on my part. Um, I think clearly didn't understand that I was worried about the blood on his floor and was thinking that I was upset because I had a little bit of blood on my hand. He took my hand, yelled at me uh, for being such a baby and this sort of thing, ripped the skin off the blister, which was common back in those days, um, and then told me to rub chalk in it, which again was common. Uh, but I think the key there was the importance, and I knew it, and I did, of remaining perfectly neutral, showing absolutely nothing on my face. So, composure and we won't get hurt. Composure as adults raged was definitely how I stayed safe as a child. And now, in the newsletter, I mentioned another early childhood memory, my infamous rubber band incident. I clearly remember that teacher, grade one. I was six, I liked her. She was, she was really lovely. This one day, we were all quietly stringing rubber bands onto a grid of nails, uh, that had been kind of nailed into a little wooden, uh, a little wooden block. It's hard to explain. It was the seventies, and I was in a progressive school. I think it was math. I'm not sure. One rubber band got loose. To this day, I remember the name Alan as the little boy who shot the rubber band. It was an accident. It could have happened to any of us. Immediately, though, the teacher commanded all heads down. And we stayed there for what seemed like an eternity. I, I know in this case it wasn't that long. But as she admonished us about the dangers of rubber bands, and I remember being also at the same time really scared and also understanding how funny this was, even at the time. I really can't remember how it was resolved, but all I know is that we all knew then that it was an accident. and that none of us could say that because she wanted a bad guy to punish. So these stories taken together, it's why we can't have nice things. <laughs> I'm only kidding a little. That was another thought that had come up. As I drove home from counseling, all this came together and I realized that I occasionally create little talismans little incantations to keep my personal Eden secure, to keep my castle walls strong, unconsciously, of course. And it's possible that I'm making too much of this smoothie, a tempest in a smoothie cup, perhaps. <laughs> but also, I think there's at least a grain of truth here. There's a feeling in the air recently of needing to magically create safe spaces around certain groups where we feel secure. Certain incantations we do to help delineate a perimeter within which our in-group resides. I don't have any answers. As my dear husband always says when I bring up the unhoused, well, as a Christian, shouldn't you invite them to live with us? I'm kind of surprised he says that because he must be at least a little, a little worried that I might just do that. But he's got a point. He really does. Here's what I think is impossible to do without inviting the sacred into our lives. Not the spiritual exactly, but sacred love, the holy. I think it's impossible to do benevolence. Chances are the unhoused in my city would like a house not to live with me. <laughs> and chances are certain people who are not in my in-group are perfectly happy being not in my in-group. We don't all have to have a kumbaya moment together necessarily. What we need, I think, 
goes beyond oxytocin, beyond science, beyond politics. What I mean, what we need, I think, is to inject an acceptance of sacred love into our daily lives. I said it. I think it's essential. This comes not only from my admittedly huge bias as a Christian, but also from my recent books, both or that I've read, not written, obviously, but The Master and His Emissary by Ian McGilchrist and The Dawn of Everything by the two Davids. I always forget both of their names. Went Crow and Graver. And I think we need possibly a little less spirituality. Listen, Bell Hooks said, I'm often struck by the dangerous narcissism fostered by spiritual rhetoric that pays so much attention to individual self-improvement and so little to the practice of love within the context of community. I think she's onto something there, was onto something there. I'm going to leave us here. I think all this needs to settle. I think I need a cup of tea, a long walk. And I welcome feedback about these oral essays as well as the conversations that I've had. Next week, as I mentioned, is likely going to be a conversation that I've worked on for over a year now. It needed time and contemplation. I am enjoying sprinkling these shorter essays in now and again, so feedback's welcome. They aren't as amplified as the conversations, but I'm not sure yet if that's because they suck <laughs> or because I just don't amplify them on social media. In any case, thank you, and please rate, review, and subscribe on whatever platform you use to listen to podcasts. If you want to rate, review, and subscribe on a podcast platform, but you don't know how, just ask. And consider subscribing to the Monday Morning Newsletter, too. You can find everything that I'm doing right now at Underbelly, which is at U-N-D-E-R-B-E-L dot L-I. Have a lovely week.